satu floor ni kebanyakannya satu tenant je. Ha ni tak silap ada 60 rumah. Tapi tu tak ada jiran juga. This is for city. A 100 billion dollar futuristic town located off the coast of Malaysia, just a few miles away from Singapore. Built as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, this luxury housing development was created to attract rich Chinese investors who wanted to live close to an economic and cultural hub like Singapore. Its high-rise apartment complexes were designed to house more than 700,000 people, but take a stroll through this green city. But hardly anyone is using them. Only about 9,000 people live here, and most of the units that you see behind me are actually still empty. And you'll come to the grim realization that it's essentially a ghost town. Despite its great location and modern design, the city has only managed to attract 1% of its intended population. It was built by Chinese real estate giant Country Garden, which is now facing a default on its 194 billion dollar outstanding debt and already declared losses of around 7.5 billion dollars in the first half of 2023. Country Garden's troubles have been a big worry for the sector. It had long been considered financially sound compared to peers. So after it missed some debt payments, investors asked whether any real estate firm was on safe ground. Sarah, earlier today, I visited one of Country Garden's un unfinished uh, projects here in Beijing, and uh, there were workmen on the property. Salespeople were there trying to convince customers that even though the company does face default, that it will make good on its promise to deliver home. This isn't some small corporation. It directly employs nearly 70,000 people and has assets of over 252 billion dollars. But right now, it's sinking fast due to a cash crunch that's been haunting real estate developers across China for three years now. Despite getting some reprieve from creditors, the company is still heading towards bankruptcy. And this pretty much sums up what's actually happening in China, where the real estate market is losing one major player after another. The country's biggest real estate giant, Evergrande, has already filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy after defaulting on its $300 billion debt back in 2021. And if the real estate market keeps cooling down, more and more companies will be facing a similar ending. And I'm sure many of you are wondering how these companies accumulated so much debt and why are they now tumbling down one after another? To get answers to these questions, we need to go back in time and look at how these companies started in the first place. How did we get here? The Chinese real estate sector, which currently makes up 30% of its $18.7 trillion GDP, didn't really exist for the first 50 years of the country's history. Before 1998, most Chinese nationals depended on their state employers to provide housing. In fact, you couldn't even start a private housing development company since all the urban land was owned by the state according to the constitution, so you couldn't really go around building skyscrapers whenever you wanted. This all changed, however, when in the late 80s the country decided to copy the land use model of Hong Kong, which at the time was a British colony. According to this model, the government could sell land, use rights to property developers, and as part of a long-term lease. At the time, the central as well as the municipal governments desperately needed cash to fuel rapid financial growth. So they eventually budged, and by the start of 1998, the country had officially decided to give a free hand to the real estate market. They allowed people to buy flats, and pretty soon, you had millions and millions of new house buyers who were buying these flats at a premium in big cities because the better pay in these places allowed them to afford their own home. So the urbanization of China kind of acted like an adrenaline shot to revive a dead sector, which soon became the golden goose for the national economy. The meteoric rise of the real estate sector was also helped by the fact that Chinese people love buying land. In fact, even now, 70% of the entire urban household wealth in China is locked up in real estate. There are multiple cultures and economic reasons behind this trend. 
You have to understand that since most people couldn't even buy a home for most of Chinese history, the idea of owning your own home is like the ultimate dream for most people. Having your own home not only raises your social status, but also allows you to enjoy better employment and education opportunities. Then there is also the fact that real estate has always been considered a secure place to invest your hard-earned money. In China, it was especially lucrative in the 2000s because the sector was generating an enormous amount of wealth. Just look at how much the average price of a home went up between 1998 and 2018. In 1998, the average price of a square meter of real estate in China was 2,000 yuan. 20 years later, the square meter was being sold for 8,700 yuan. That's a 430% return on investment. This return has been astronomically higher in top-tier cities like Shanghai, where the house prices have gone up by over 2,000% in the last two decades. So, it's not hard to see why pretty much anyone who had money to invest was pumping it into the real estate sector. With this much money coming into the market, the big players quickly capitalized on relaxed borrowing laws and turned into the biggest corporations in the world in a single decade. Evergrande, whose fall in 2021 first shed light on the flimsy and risky nature of the Chinese real estate model, which was a beacon of success for 10 years. The company's revenue rose from 46 billion yuan in 2010 to a staggering 507 billion yuan in 2020. It became the biggest real estate company in the world in 2018. And this kind of growth was seen across the spectrum with pretty much every big developer growing at an unprecedented rate. Country Garden, whose Malaysian disaster we saw earlier, had a revenue of just $3.8 billion in 2010. And it ballooned to an annual revenue of $81 billion in 2021. The main problem. However, this success which seemed remarkable on paper wasn't really achieved through a sustainable business model. These giant corporations take huge loans to develop new cities and housing projects, and they would usually sell these properties before the completion of the project. This financial model allowed them to take more loans and pick up even more projects, but it also made sure that most of their assets were not liquid. Now, this model can work in a country like China, which has a huge population and has been going through quick urbanization for decades now. Things, however, became shaky when these same companies began taking on riskier projects, like Forest City, which was built on the coast of Malaysia, but was aimed at attracting Chinese nationals. There are hundreds of such speculative developments across China, which allow the developers to continue fueling growth, but now sits as vacant and are often populated by cattle and wildlife. Another big factor that hollowed the foundation of the real estate sector was miscalculation and an overly optimistic view of the future of the housing market. Companies like Evergrande kept building new cities in relatively remote parts of China because they were sure that the growing economy would bring jobs to these places. What they failed to see is that the Chinese population is aging faster than expected, so the need for new homes was going to go down eventually. The slowdown in the economy and the rising house prices also made it hard for potential buyers to invest in these speculative properties. And the effect of these factors were compounded by the pandemic, which hammered the Chinese economy and put millions of people out of work. This was like adding high-octane fuel to a forest fire, and pretty soon you had real estate titans going out of business left, right, and center. The impact on the Chinese economy as this fall can spell disaster for the Chinese economy, which is already struggling to get back on its feet after the pandemic, to get an idea of just how devastating a total collapse of the real estate sector can be for China, you need to realize that the Chinese economy is dependent more on real estate than the US on the bond market in 2008. The housing market directly or indirectly employs 49 million people and brought in 18 trillion yuan in sales in 2021. And the taxes on these properties are key sources of income for most Chinese municipalities. These local governments also make money by auctioning land, and this inflow of cash allows them to fuel rapid growth. 
their cash cow is now slowly dying and their revenue from real estate has already dropped from 38% in 2020 to 30% in 2022. This kind of sudden loss of income has resulted in mounting debt and according to the IMF, these local governments are now sitting on $9 trillion of debt with no way to raise money and the revenue from the real estate sector keeps falling every month. This is bound to slow down growth in many of these municipalities, which in turn will put more burden on the national economy. Another side effect of the decline in the real estate sector has been the pressure on the average Chinese homeowner. Millions of people are now waiting in line to see if their homes that they paid for are even going to be completed. Evergrande alone has more than 1.5 million unfinished homes, and the families who have paid thousands of dollars as down payments on these homes are now in a limbo since the company has filed for bankruptcy. Consequences for the world Now I'm pretty sure many people outside of China might feel like this financial crisis doesn't concern them. Sure, you feel bad for the millions of people who might lose their homes and life savings, but you don't see how the fall of these mega corporations can affect you in any way. Well, this is where things get rather scary. You see, China has been a key force behind the growth of the global economy in the last decade. The increasing wealth of the Chinese consumer has made the country a key offshore investor and importer of goods from all over the world. It's also the biggest exporter in the world, so a slowdown is definitely going to have an impact on the global economy especially for countries like the US, which receives a lot of investments in the tech sector from China. The biggest threat, however, is the global tourism industry, which earned $280 billion in 2019 from Chinese tourists. Japan alone earned 1.9 trillion yuan from these tourists in 2019. Unfortunately, the party had to come to an abrupt halt due to the pandemic, but at the start of 2023, Many of these countries were hoping to get millions of tourists from China as the country finally relaxed restrictions on travel. But as you can see from this graph, this rebound didn't really happen. A general slowdown in the economy and a decline in household wealth because of the collapse of the real estate sector has forced the people of China to spend cautiously. Suddenly, families that had money to visit countries like Thailand and the US are now scared to spend anything on leisure. According to experts, if the real estate fails to bounce back, this situation will only get worse with time. What's next? And that brings us to the most important question. Is recovery even possible for this sector? Well, according to many financial experts, the Chinese government might be forced to help out these dying companies. Do you see when a company like Country Garden is currently developing an area twice the size of Manhattan Island, it can officially be classified as too big to fail. It employs way too many people, and its total collapse can be disastrous for the national economy. That's probably why the central government is now encouraging banks not only to continue lending to these giant corporations, but is also asking national lenders to give extensions on certain loans to make sure that these companies don't default. They've also slashed interest rates on house loans to encourage people to buy more homes. This is a stark contrast from their tightened policies of 2020. But they really don't have a choice here. The country needs the money from the real estate sector to fuel its growth. So it has to step in to save these dying conglomerates. However, they will need to introduce better policies eventually. Otherwise, any solution will just be a band-aid and the sector will collapse sooner or later. And that wraps up today's video. I would love to know your thoughts on this topic, so don't forget to comment. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.